I want people's focus to shift from bashing it and being frustrated and not knowing how it's going to affect their business to working with the algorithm and developing a strategy that can stand the test of time. Hey, I'm Becca with the Happy Ever Crafter. And if you are an artist of any kind and you ever have posted on Instagram, we're gonna to wanna to watch this video. This week I'm talking to Jenna Rainey, who is walking us through her five ninja tricks for beating the Instagram algorithm. It's a long one, but it's a good one. So let's jump right in. Jenna, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, I'm excited to be back. <laughs> it really like wasn't that long ago that I had you on, but it's a totally different topic today, which is exciting. Cause I think that, I feel like as soon as I saw that you were launching a course about Instagram, I was like, Okay, well, I have to have her back on the show because it's one of the questions I get all the time. So I'm really excited I'm sure. to do this one. I'm sure. I love talking about Instagram too and helping other people who are business owners or not show up on Instagram in the right way because it can be frustrating sometimes, mm -hmm. especially with all the algorithm tweaks. And so I'm really mm -hmm. excited to be back. Yeah. So, okay. Well, for people who didn't see the last one, can you give us a little rundown of who you are and what you do and how all of this has kind of snowballed for you over the past couple of years? Yeah, for sure. So I am a creative entrepreneur. I'm an artist, um, an educator, an author. I have two best-selling how-to watercolor books um, published by 10 Speed Press, and I've done everything over the last eight years from being a wedding stationer and scaling that business to six fig figures and then selling that and then pivoting into licensing. So I do a lot of licensing now where I'm designing patterns and artwork for manufacturers to put on products that are sold in retail stores like Target and Staples and other types of businesses. And I have a few online courses where I help other creatives build profitable and thriving businesses of their own because so many creative creatives struggle with hitting that consistent revenue and um, knowing how to price their work and just put their work out there with confidence. And so I put together a lot of online courses and now I'm mainly an educator and then licensing as well. Yeah. And speaking of licensing, that's what we talked about a little bit last time. So mm -hmm. I'll link to that video for, for anybody who wants to see more about that. But mm -hmm. today we're talking about Instagram and speaking of like all the different things that you've done and how your business has changed. Do you feel like Instagram is totally different than it was when you first started? Because I do. I <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, it's an interesting place to like Night start the conversation. Yeah. So it's completely different. I started uh, posting my work on Instagram in January-ish or maybe actually September 2012. <laughs> um, and there was no algorithm at the time. And so everything was, you know, just posted when you posted it and it showed up in your feed at the same time that you posted it. So if people were on at the same time, then it made sense they would see your post. Um, and at the time, there wasn't many people, especially in the creative field, showing up on Instagram and using it as a marketing tool for their business. So I had like this day job that I absolutely hated and um, Instagram became this just avenue for me to show the art that I was doing on the side as a little hobby from my kitchen table after, you know, commuting home from my nine to five at a financial planning office. And so wildly different. Um, the filters are, you know, insanely different as well. Like I used Remember to that, throw like, sepia one. <laughs> I was just going to say, I used to throw like the nastiest sepia tone filters on all of my artwork. And I'm like, what was I even thinking? You, it doesn't even look true to what I was painting. And yeah, and my artwork at the time sucked. I was a beginner. I was just learning and it was just fun for me. It was really fun. And then it just snowballed over time um, because it was the right time, right place. But then also now pivoting and being able to scale my business through Instagram has been one of the biggest ways I've been able to grow and scale at the rapid rate that it's been the past few years. Um, but yeah, it's completely different. So the stuff that you would have put on Instagram that long ago, would it still be at the bottom of your feed right now? Oh yeah. Um, okay, like so when, I kept when, everything. <laughs> so when I see, when I edit this video, I'm going to totally scroll down to the bottom and I'll pop some up on the screen just Do so it. we can see exactly what you're oh talking about. Do um, it, but as as you're saying that, I was thinking about, and I've said this to people before that uh, I have a similar story with, with, you know, starting it as a side hustle and just doing like putting stuff on Instagram because I wanted to and I enjoyed it. Um, 
and it snowballed. But I've said to people recently, they'll ask me, you know, how did you get so many followers? How did you grow so fast? And I think that I like, it's, it's really hard to answer that question because it's so different now. And so like my advice to people is always kind of, uh, like ever evolving because it changes so often. And I think that, uh, if, if someone were to start now and do the things that I did then, it wouldn't work. And there's also a lot more people doing it on Instagram now too. So I know that you have prepared like five ninja ninja tricks to beat this stupid algorithm on Instagram. So <laughs> maybe I'll just let you jump into it and then like I can we can have a conversation around certain things if I think I have something important to say too. Absolutely. All right. So yeah, over like you said, over the last eight years, um, since I've been using Instagram for business, it's been a constant change and a constant, you know, where you have to test and tweak your strategy on Instagram. And I see this is so common online. And while I completely understand, you know, complaining and being frustrated by all the tweaks in the algorithm and the dips in engagement and the stagnant follower growth, I totally understand and understand where people are coming from. However, it's just like anything else. Like it's, there's always a motive behind the people who the people of Instagram, for example, like their literal, their literal market stock prices depend on the retention of people's attention spans on their app. And so they have to constantly be updating it, have to constantly be tweaking it. And so I want people's focus to shift from bashing it and being frustrated and not knowing how it's going to affect their business to working with the algorithm and developing a strategy that can stand the test of time, whether it's, you know, an algorithm tweak or a new platform like TikTok that maybe takes over and, you know, leaves Instagram in the dust or whatever. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but just saying there's something that's going to come up just like what happened a few years back with Facebook, you know, Facebook was the it place. And then now it's completely, I mean, it's still really, really great for business and that's a completely other topic, but you know, now Instagram is a huge, huge tool for businesses and brands because of the visual aspect and the personal aspect with stories, et cetera. So what I really want to get for your audience and what I want people to get away from this training today is some tips that will hopefully encourage them to understand that they can beat the algorithm and they can work with the algorithm um, through understanding what the whole motive behind the algorithm is. And so Instagram, a couple of years ago when the algorithm kind of was instilled or made in place their statement and this is kind of like the thesis of this training it when they came out um, with the algorithm they said the order of photos in your feed will be based on the likelihood you'll be interested in the content your relationship with the person posting and the timeliness of the post and so are those are the three main things we're gonna like dig deep into with the five ninja hacks so they actually claimed that the change was to improve user experience because that's their main goal they want users to be on their platform for as long as possible versus something like a snapchat or a TikTok, they want to have their users because that drives their market prices up their stock prices up so they want to improve user experience and to prioritize the moments our audience our audiences care about the most because that gets the user, our audience, on the platform for longer. So if they're engaging, liking and commenting, et cetera. So with these changes came a lot of challenges, as you were saying, for brands and businesses looking to grow their engagement and their followers and on Instagram. And I already mentioned this, but so many people are bashing and complaining about the algorithm and I totally get it and it can be really frustrating. And so if you've experienced a dip in your engagement uh, or stagnant follower growth like I have over the couple last couple years, there is a way to actually, because here's the thing, seven, no, five plus years ago, I was gaining a thousand followers a day. Like that Same. was an R. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like lucky if I've gained 40 followers a day. Like I know that may sound crazy to some people who are listening who are like, I only have 400 followers. Like, uh, that's, that must be amazing. Like I, I get it. It's all relative. Um, but it can be frustrating if you've spent so much time on this platform and you're like, this is like literally my brand, like it all goes away without Instagram. Well, how can we shift our focus so that we can st stand the test of time with all the algorithm tweaks and whether or not your follower uh, count grows or not, or whether you reach these benchmarks of popularity or whatever. Um, it's not about the numbers. It's about working with the algorithm to serve the audience that you already have and the community that you already have. Because if you have 400 followers and you're serving them super well, 
guess what? That's 400 people that could be purchasing your offers, the prints that you have in your shop or whatever. And if, and if you're treating them like fans and friends and building that relationship with them, they're going to be loyal customers. I love that you said that it's not about growing. It's not about the popularity contest, having that many followers. I mean, like you said, people will, as we're talking about this, be like, oh, well, that's easy for you to say you have, you know, however many followers, but it really truly is more about the engagement than Mm -hmm. the actual number of people. And I was speaking at a conference recently and someone asked me like, how do you get more followers? And I, my actual answer was stop thinking about getting more followers, treat the ones that you have amazingly and naturally you will get more followers. So like it's just kind of switching your thinking on it Mm -hmm. and the outcome will be the same, but it's the Mm -hmm. thought pattern that has Mm -hmm. to change. I mean, you just even have to think about their new beta testing, which you're in Canada. So I think this was already rolled out for you guys. Yeah. With it's the old hiding news for lights. Us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's new for Americans and we're like, nah, what's happening? <laughs> you can't hide my likes. Everybody's freaking out about it. But you have to think about it like the way that they're thinking, think like Instagram and think like how, what they're trying to achieve. Even back to that statement that they released when they announced the algorithm a few years ago about their determining the likelihood of your audience's interest in your content. So whether it's going to resonate with them or not, it's going to determine where it lines up on your feed, on their feed based on the algorithm. And then the relationship that they have to you. So, you know, this might be why you always see those posts from your mom and you always see your post or the post from your best friend or whatever, because you guys are interacting with each other and sending DMs back and forth and not just simple DMs like a kissy heart emoji or whatever. It's like actual conversations and conversations and posts. So you have to think about building relationships with your followers because that's going to signal to the algorithm, which is machine vision analyzing. And it's so, so intense and so in depth, um, like way beyond, like I, I, you know, have no idea how intense it is, but I've done so much research and studying and, and, um, have marketing experts that are mentors of mine and have helped me understand it a little bit, but you have to think about building relationships with your followers because that's going to literally trigger to the algorithm that maybe you guys are close friends or you guys have a stronger connection, et cetera. So they want to see more of your posts. So to get into it, because there are five tricks that can help you beat the algorithm. And it's not just about the numbers, like we were saying, it's way beyond that because if you're focusing on the numbers, you're not going to move anywhere, especially because algorithm or Instagram's focus now is, you know, hiding likes and they want to build community. They don't want it to be about the numbers because people were just starting to hire like agencies or these bot accounts that were scaling so rapidly in follower account, like by hacking and beating the system. And so they had to crack down. They had to make this algorithm the way it is, et cetera. So the first of five ninja tricks or hacks that I would recommend um, you start with is to build relationships with your audience through engagement. And so think about it. Um, like I was saying earlier about, you know, you're always seeing your, the post from your mom or your best friend, and it's because you guys are having conversations on the app and um, liking most of each other's posts, um, saving or sending things to each other, like, you know, that stupid cat video, you're sending it to your husband or your best friend. Um, that is signaling to the algorithm that you guys are close. And so therefore, they're always going to see your posts in their feed at a higher up on their feed. Um, and so if you are like, how do I get my followers, my audience, um, with my brand on Instagram to interact with me in a way that, uh, tells the algorithm that they are loyal, dedicated fans and brand evangelists. And we're, we have a deeper relationship and that's through engagement. And I'm not saying all of these tricks, by the way, to just like say, here's some secrets to beat and hack the system and like ways to, you know, these are people. So really approach this app, like you're building a community and you're serving your audience. So most people won't comment on your posts unless they are actually prompted. And so if you're like, well, how do I get my people to engage? I post and crickets, like nobody ever shows up for me. I get a few likes, but like my mom is the only one who comments. And so how do we actually get our audience to comment on our posts, save them, et cetera. And so I have a few different types of call to action that you can include in your captions and even on stories, if you're talking to your audience through stories. Um, But 
the first type of call to action, which is important to include in certain captions, is um, to help your community um, basically ask for a help ask for help on a decision. So if you're coming out with a new course or a new product and you need help naming that product or that course, like for example, I'm coming out with a course in the spring that's all about teaching in-person workshops for creatives like watercolor, calligraphy workshops, etc. And so I could literally in a caption on my Instagram say, I need your help. I'm launching a new course soon on teaching creative workshops, should the name be Crafting Creative Courses, creative courses that sell, digital creative workshops or something, or whatever, whatever the options are. And people can't help but answer the question because they love providing their, their feedback. They love helping you make decisions, et cetera. One thing on, on that that I've noticed works a lot better um, is to give like a couple of options as opposed to say mm -hmm. like, what should I name my course? Because then mm -hmm. it like actually takes people thought time and they'll scroll right. right by it and they won't answer as opposed mm -hmm. to being like a b or c and then they can just put the yes. one letter or whatever it is yes. that gets a lot i've noticed that I, i've tested that a couple times yeah you have to give them options yeah or else they'll just be like i don't know i don't have time to spend like coming up with a, f a creative name um yeah so ask for help on a decision is the first type of call to action to include because people with will without prompting they won't be commenting um, and then another type of call to action is to ask for their opinion. I love doing this one, um, but people love giving their opinion. So you could literally ask something like, what's your favorite friends versus the office? Or what are your favorite podcasts? I'm looking to branch out. I'm listening to the same podcast over and over. I need some new ideas or new shows on Netflix or whatever. Or if you had $10,000 given to you today, what would you do with it? Those type of questions. Those type of questions and call to actions are super like, can't help myself but comment. And then the same thing goes for stories as well. If you use the polls, and that's the thing too, you have to think about why Instagram rolled out these things like the poll and the question box and stories and gifts and all of that. It's to help you get more engagement on your posts. And so using them, like for a user, it's so easy to hit the yes or no on the poll or like to give an opinion on something or to type in a question in the question box, et cetera, because it's just, why wouldn't I? It's so easy to tap something um, and I can't help myself. So ask for their opinion, either in a post or in a story. And it's really easy, a lot easier to get engagement that way. Um, and sharing a story. This is a huge, huge bit. A lot of people um, in my audience are like unsure of if they should be showing up like more you know direct to camera and stories or share, sharing bits of their life or showing more of their personality and my thing is it's up to you and your brand however um we all have things in common like you know the boring stuff in our life like we all go to the grocery store and don't have groceries in our fridge or we all have piles and piles of laundry building up over the past couple weeks because we're so busy or like those little bits of our lives that seem so boring in common, they resonate with our audience because we all have them in common. And so that resonating factor is huge for building trust and huge for driving results in your business because you're building that no like and trust factor very simply because you're just sharing the bits of your life that are super common and maybe boring and you don't have to get super, you know, like, you know, what should I share today? I have nothing to say. It doesn't have to be very complicated. Like I share, you know, come up with, show up with spit up on my shirt. I show up with messy hair, et cetera. And it's just common. It's stuff we all have in common. So sharing a story is something that can resonate with your audience and help them, you know, put those walls down and feel like they actually know, like, and trust you. And it makes them more likely to engage with your content in the future. Um, I can't remember who I was hearing if it was a podcast or something that I was watching, but someone uh, said that in a really easy way to understand was just like posting things that would make your audience go, Oh my God, me too. Like yeah. anything that makes them say me too would have, I mean, in the good way, not the bad way, the me too. <laughs> right. <laughs> anything that has them, anything that has them looking at what you're doing and being like, Oh my God, she's just like me kind of thing is I love absolutely that. Yeah. gonna, I will say though, like if, 
there's like a line sometimes mm-hmm. where totally. like, I, I, you know, not everybody wants to see what you're having for breakfast every single day or like every, oh, yeah. you know, that if it's like completely oh, yeah. unrelated to what you do, but mm-hmm. there's like, there are certain things where you can think like the friends or the office kind of thing. Like if I'm mm-hmm. watching friends, I'll put it on and everyone else will be like, Oh my God, she watches friends too. You know, I mean, everyone like in the world does. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, anything that's like me too, I think is super yes. valuable. And to your point about like, not everybody wants to see your breakfast and it has to kind of like make sense. All of what I'm saying here is, first of all, they can all be huge, huge um, ways to measure what is resonating with your audience and also great ways to get feedback from your audience and start having conversations with them to build those relationships and to get to know them so that you can craft better offers the next time you go to launch an online course or the next time you go to design new prints and list them in your Etsy shop, Etsy shop, whatever it is. Um, if you're just like willy nilly showing up and like hoping people will purchase those prints that you just listed or book you for your services, but you don't actually know your audience at all, um, you're probably not going to perform very well and generate the sales that you'd like to see and the results that you'd like to see if you don't know your audience. And so while these things, they may sound like strategies and like ways to do, you know, like be mathematical about it or whatever. It's mostly about understanding your audience and building those relationships with them so that you can know how to better serve them with your actual informative posts, with with your educational posts, like you with your YouTube, like getting to know your audience through Instagram and YouTube, et cetera. Like you know your audience very well and you know that they're looking to learn new things about creative creativity or careers, et cetera. And so knowing that and listening to your audience, you're interviewing me, you're interviewing people about different aspects of creative careers, et cetera. And that's because you listen and you're getting to know your audience and you have a relationship with them. If we're just showing up and posting work that we think will resonate with our audience and that we think they might buy or book us for, we probably won't get the best results. And so it's really about shifting your focus from, I didn't get a thousand followers this month to who are the 400 people that are following me and how can I get to know them so well that they become raving, raving, dedicated fans and brand evangelists of my work that they do help me grow just organically because they're promoting my work for me and they're telling their friends about my work, et cetera, or their family or whatever. So, and then the last tip that I have under this very first point of five ninja tricks is, uh, you know, call to action, um, can't help themselves, but post type of thing. So, you know, um, this is where if you're a business owner or a brand owner, if you are celebrating a milestone, like you just signed a book deal or you reached a revenue goal, or you're really excited about this thing or another, whatever it is sharing with your audience and then having them celebrate with you. So asking them to drop their favorite, like happy emoji in the comments or whatever. And if you think about it, like a simple emoji takes a person a lot less time to type it out than a full on like thoughtful comment. And so those thoughtful comments um, or responses to questions, et cetera, are going to trigger the algorithm a lot more in terms of um, getting people to engage more with your post because sending an emoji is super quick and easy. Um, So they're not spending as much time as if they were typing out a thoughtful post or comment or DM. Um, But those are great to throw in every once in a while. So you're not, you know, just writing those huge long blog posts of captions every single time because people are going to get over it and keep scrolling. Um, But just a little quick win and people love like helping you celebrate. Um, I was actually going to ask you about that, uh, like having people post uh, like an A or a B or a C to answer a question or an emoji or like a yes or no kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The questions that are like low hanging fruit to get people to comment Mm -hmm. versus um, the longer form, like thoughtful comments and how the Mm -hmm. algorithm sees that. Have you done much research on that? And like, what do you recommend to people for that? Um, Yeah. I mean, so I studied psychology for my undergrad and obviously I'm not like a therapist or anything, but I'm really fascinated by how people consume information and what gets people to, you know, not just buy, but like, you know, engage and like how people read and then everything from like email marketing, what gets people to click and open and all of that and testing things. So I, instead of saying like, you know, this is how the algorithm works with long form versus shorter captions that are like the, like you said, the low hanging fruit, you have to think about how people learn. There's so many different types of people. There's so many different types of people when it comes to how they learn, how they read, how they engage with something. And so my thing is, is I post every, like, this isn't like a mathematical equation or anything, but I post 
probably once every four posts is a long form post and it's something thoughtful and something inspirational, a story or whatever. And then there's like, for example, there's people that need to just see the bullet points. That's me. I'm a type eight on the Enneagram. I um, am just like a total, just give me the bullet points, make it bold if possible. I don't want to, I don't want to read all these pages. Like I got stuff to do. Just get me to my, get me to the point, get me to the nitty gritty stuff, no fluff. And then there's people who, you know, the pulling on the heartstrings and the thoughtful, like, you know, something that they can really resonate with, whether it's an insecurity that you have that they have in common or whatever, like they need that type of content and it really lights them up and it makes them engage with your posts even more. And then there's people who need like actionable tips that are reasons why and facts that back them up. And um, so there, it's thorough still, but it's not backed by like emotion and story. That's the, you know, more long form story type of inspirational posts. So there's so many different types of people and the way that they engage with your posts. So I recommend to switch it up and then always be testing and tweaking and analyzing your metrics on in insights on your actual posts, which I show people how to do in my course, Instagram for creatives, because it's so much is like, you can be thinking it's resonating and thinking it's performing well, but there are just little tweaks that you can be doing here and there in your performance that can skyrocket stuff and help with growth, but also driving real results in your business. Um, One so. thing I, uh, as you're talking about all the different types of people, I'm the worst because I, again, I can't remember who said it, but there was something recently and someone was talking about, they were talking about doing longer form emails and copywriting and mm -hmm. stuff for that, but it, it applies to captions too. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you're saying, but the, the way that she explained it was you have to think about your audience, like the characters and friends and how differently they would all want, how different they would all want things. Like That's Monica hilarious. would want to read, like she would want to know every single detail yep. about the thing you're talking about. And she would read every word probably more than Amazing. once. And then you have like Phoebe who would just want like the bold points and just like whatever. Mm -hmm. Joey would want a funny gif or a joke or something like all yes. these different. And so you think about it in the characters of friends and then you rotate your content like so that you can talk mm -hmm. about the same thing seven times or whatever, but it's always worded a little bit differently. And I was like, that yes. is genius. That is and brilliant. I will never forget that. I love that. Yeah. Dang, I love that. That's such a good analogy. I wish I yeah. could work with it. <laughs> I love it. You can use it, but I got to find who said right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah, find who said it and send that to me. That's amazing. I yeah. love it. Um, cool. So the second ninja trick that I have for um, beating the algorithm is consistency. So going back to the original... Um, statement that it's Instagram released about the likelihood of, you know, helping people beat the algorithm or whatever is their interest in content. So obviously building a relationship with them, but then also the timeliness of their posts. So posting consistently tells the algorithm that you are a quality account. There's so many bot accounts out there and there's so many like ways Instagram is trying to crack down on the people who are trying to get rich quick by just gaining a lot of followers. And then, you know, posting or doing the clickbait type stuff that was getting people a lot of followers um, a few years back before the algorithm was just, you know, showing a booty pic or whatever and like talking about some spam stuff in the caption and it wasn't actually correlated. And so if you're able to show up consistently and stick to that schedule. So I get this question a lot of like how off, like how many times a week should I be posting or how many times a day should I be posting? You just have to decide what is realistic for you and your schedule and stick to that and be consistent with it. Because if you're, you know, posting a lot this month and then for a few week, few, few weeks, you're not, you know, your audience isn't hearing from you. A, you're not going to be staying front of mind for your audience, but it's also telling the, the algorithm that you're no longer using the account or you're not a quality account anymore, or you're not taking it seriously about like building an, a community. And so stick to it. Um, your posting schedule consistently. I personally post five to six times in my main feed a week. And I usually take Sundays off unless I'm in the middle of a launch, but, and then all I do in stories is show at least one to five minutes worth of my day and people think like you have to show all of it like I really only scratch at the surface of my life uh, as you know what I show on stories there's so much more behind the scenes that's going on in my life that my audience has no clue about and so you if you feel like vulnerable and you don't know how much to share of your personal life you really don't need to share that much like just showing 15 to 30 seconds of you know like hanging out with your baby if you want to show your kids or, you know, going to the grocery store, whatever, it's totally up to you. And then also sharing the behind the scenes stuff of you working on a project and all of that is really engaging and helps people 
um, become aware of what you do without you having to overtly sell to them. Um, and then so when you post consistently good content to Instagram, uh, you'll not only, you know, improve your engagement, but it's a signal to the algorithm that you are a quality count if you keep it up. So that's my t second ninja trick. Um, and then my third ninja tick, tick. <laughs> Third ninja trick, it's hard to say actually, um, is to find the right hashtags. Um, and so this is a big question as well, is like what hashtag should I use? And a lot of people just kind of copy and paste um, the same set of hashtags over and over again. And I actually use an app called Plan, P-L-A-N-N, -N, um, to help me like measure um, how sets of hashtags are performing and to also save sets of hashtags so I can switch it up um, because that's another thing too. The algorithm will actually be noticing that you're just copy and pasting a set of hashtags over and over again and that will demote you on the algorithm. So um, it may not seem important. Instagram hashtags might not seem important like the actual nitty gritty of them and which ones to use. But according to recent studies, this is from Sprout Social, um, Instagram posts with at least one hashtag got 70% more likes and 392% more comments than those without hashtags. So that's pretty huge, if I just say so myself. Um, but a lot of people aren't using the right hashtags. They're doing the big popular ones that have millions and millions of posts in them, or they kind of look sleazy and spammy and they wouldn't correlate with the posts they're talking about anyway. And so you gotta niche it down. So you have to think about your audience size and try and go after the majority of the hashtags that you use, try and go after um, hashtags that have the same amount of posts or similar amount of posts that you have followers. So that's gonna mean that you're gonna get seen more easily, um, not just under the recent feed within a hashtag, but also on the popular side. So if you look at under a hashtag and you'll see that there's two different channels, um, tabs, whatever you want to call them. There's recent and then there's the more popular, popular, whatever it's called. Um, but if you are posting to the ones that have like 50 million people, you know, posts in it, you're not going to get seen ever unless you are Kim Kardashian or something. Um, but because she gets so much engagement, so that's going to mean she's going to be on the top of the the popular side. But if you are, you know, let's say you have 10,000 followers and let's say you're using 10 hashtags that have around 10,000 posts in them and they're really, really targeted hashtags, like hashtags that make sense for attracting your ideal customer, not just because. Like you actually have to think about, about them as keywords like you would in your product descriptions on Etsy or, um, you know, how people are discovering you on Pinterest or YouTube, etc. So thinking about them in terms of keywords keywords and how they relate to the topic that you're talking about in that caption and on that post um, and that's how people can discover you so for example you need to find your sweet spot and reach a highly targeted audience and zero in with very specific niche hashtags so if you are eyeing, eyeing um, like stationary lovers for example like when I was a wedding stationer for the first five years of my business for instance, the hashtag, hashtag stationary will place your post in a broad feed of like 4.6 million other posts, which is a whole lot. I have 180,000 followers at this point in time. And so if I'm showing up and posting and like using other huge, huge, huge hashtags like that, I'm probably not going to get any sort of traction with these hashtags. People are not going to discover me on them because they're massive. So, but instead using the hashtag, hashtag stationary lovers narrows it down and the search results within that hashtag, there's 409 or 49,000 posts within that hashtag. So that's way smaller and it's about half or a third the size of my audience size. So this gives me a greater chance of exposure and conversions in attracting people to like new followers um, and attracting the right type of followers too. It's not just about the get rich quick and attracting all of the people and all because you can't, you can't serve everyone, every type of person. And so if you're a stationer, use their stationary focused hashtags. Um, I like and, what I like that you're saying attracting the right people too, because what I find not only about not getting seen on the really big hashtags, but mm -hmm. what happens too is you get spam yes. accounts following you because oh. they have bots, like their bots, go mm -hmm. and like and comment on posts that hit that hashtag or whatever. So you'll get yes. the people that are just like, get money quick or whatever. In your yes. Comments. Yes. Um, 
And that, that always happens when you have really broad hashtags Mm -hmm. and then you get those people like following you too, but it just gets even more frustrating when you have all these fake accounts following you Mm -hmm. and your engagement's really low. So it's like, you you don't want them. Even if it's like, it boosts your ego for a second, you don't want them. Yeah. You can have way better like uh, results in terms of beating the algorithm. If you have a narrow, narrow audience of like 400, 500 people who know, like, and trust you and you have a relationships with them versus somebody who has 500,000 followers and is basically just a walking billboard of sponsor posts, but doesn't actually know her audience and is just full of those bot accounts. Like she's going to, I mean, that person, not that it's just she's, um, but the people who are, you know, there's people out there that are basically just sponsor posts after sponsored post because that's working right now. But guess what? It's not always going to work. And you do want to make sure that your business is set up so that it can, it can succeed long-term and stand the test of time, whether, you know, there's more algorithm tweaks or a new platform, like I was saying earlier, that comes up that, you know, leaves Instagram in the dust. So setting you up for success in the long-term is huge. So just before we move on from the hashtags um, item, Mm -hmm. I have a question about hashtags. Do Mm -hmm. you put your hashtags in the caption or in the first comment? I put them in the caption, uh, mainly because of timeliness. Um, And I copy, I have within the app that I use plan. You can also do this like on your notes app on your iPhone, or you can text yourself your set of hashtags. I just like organizing my hashtags and also plan helps you like analyze your metrics within hashtags and see what's, what sets performing the best for you. Um, but I always put it in the comment because that's the thing with hashtags. When you click on one specific hashtag, like I was saying, there's the recent side and then there's the popular side. And so if you're really trying to up your chances of getting seen, um, most of them, especially the bigger hashtags, um, people are finding you within the recent side of the feed. So if they're scrolling that at the time that you're posting that. So even if you were to comment, like it's only a couple seconds uh, later than when you post, but it's still like, especially in the really, really big hashtags, because I still sprinkle in the big hashtags just to see what happens and test and tweak and measure my performance once I do. Um, but the likelihood goes up if it's posted at the same time that you post your photo. So I always put it in the, in the caption. So my fourth biggest tip for beating the algorithm is DTC stories. And when I say this, so many people just cringe and are like, no, no, this is my worst fear. Um, I do not want to show my face or talk or whatever. I hate the way I look. I hate the way I sound, et cetera. But think about it. And I get it if you don't want to show up and show your face, um, but it does take practice and you do get better over time. But if you think about it, Having a conversation with somebody where you're not, you know, long distance and just over the phone is so much more engaging and um, conversational, obviously, than uh, when you're in person. So when you're in person with somebody, it's just a better conversation. And if you're um, like, I just, I look stupid, I hate the way I sound, et cetera, the three biggest tips I have for you to smile when you talk, because if you think about it, when you are having a conversation with somebody who's an acquaintance and that's what a lot of your followers are. They're acquaintances of you. They're not like your best friend or your mom, et cetera. If you're having a conversation with somebody who maybe you just met or who's an acquaintance um, and they aren't really engaging with what you say, or they're not smiling with you, et cetera, or smiling and nodding as you're talking, um, you are probably thinking to yourself, like, does this person hate me? Like they're just kind of looking at me expressionless, like, am I, did I say something wrong? What happened here? So if you smile when you talk, when you show up in direct to camera stories, it goes way above and beyond for helping your audience engage with you and feel like they're having a conversation with you versus if you show up and trust me, I was born with RBF. I don't know if I can cuss on here or not, but I was born with RBF and I definitely like show up when I'm talking and I'm being videoed. So DTC, well, can't speak DTC stories or like, you know, online courses or whatever. I always make sure that I smile when I talk because otherwise people are not engaging with me because I just look like I'm pissed off or (laughs) I'm mad at them or something. And so it does huge, huge wonders for building relatability and trust when you show up and direct to camera stories. And even if you're like, um, filming something and you're not showing your face, but you're talking while you're filming the story, uh, smile when you talk because it is just easier to listen to versus somebody who's using monotone. 
um, and it's more engaging. And again, it builds relatability and trust and it feels more exciting and like a conversation. And so um, smile when you talk and then use the text tool as well is huge in stories. A lot of people will post stories where they're talking to their camera and there's no text. And I like 80% of people on Instagram watch their stories with the volume all the way down. And I would say the only times I'm watching it uh, with the volume up is if this story like piques my interest or there's something in the little bit of text on the story that I'm interested in and I want to hear more about it and somebody's talking to their camera. So if I, I'll just scroll, scroll right by people if they don't have anything engaging in that text, little bit of text, because I don't know, they might be talking about something super valuable that I should be listening to. But to me, it just looks like they're probably talking about their kid or something boring that I don't want to listen to. Um, so I highly recommend using the text tool on all your stories because a story might just start off boring at first, but they may really engage with it, you know, at the end of the story, 15 seconds later or whatever. So use the text tool. Um, and also turn the volume all the way down when you when you're done recording a story that you're talking in and before you post. If you're new to stories and talking in stories and doing direct to camera stories, turn the volume all the way down. Nothing kills a person's confidence like hearing their own voice over and over and over again while they're typing out text or trying to find the perfect gif and all of that. And just remember, if you really truly believe that what you provide to your audience is valuable then it shouldn't be about you anymore. And the thing with artists, and I hear this all the time in the creative sphere is like, well, all I do is I just, you know, have some watercolor prints or I'm just a wedding stationer or I'm just a hairstylist or whatever. And the thing is, is value is a spectrum. It's a really wide spectrum. And so obviously the, you know, companies and the brands who are providing life transformations, like, you know, helping people achieve their weight loss goals or their health goals or, um, you know, beat some sort of illness or whatever, like that is obvious, like that is a huge value and what they have to say is incredibly value. However, value is a really wide spectrum. So if you're providing somebody with happiness, you let you give them a smile that day or giving them the confidence to show up to their brand new in-laws for the holidays without their roots showing or whatever, if you're a hairstylist, like that is also value. So if you reframe your mind as a creative person, as an artist, et cetera, and um, reframe what you offer your audience and what you're serving to your, to your community as being valuable because it is, um, then it doesn't matter the way you sound, the way you show up, the way you look, et cetera, because it shouldn't be about you anymore. It should be about them and showing them that they can smile or they can purchase that perfect gift for the person who's so difficult to buy for during the holidays with that amazing handmade watercolor print or whatever it is. So reframe your mindset. What you do provide is valuable. Show up in DTC stories. It takes practice and keep doing it consistently because you will get better. It's just like developing muscle memory when you're painting or learning a new skill. You need to keep practicing to develop that muscle memory. You need to keep practicing direct to camera videos in order to build that confidence. And so I, I'm a huge advocate for direct to camera stories because of the building relatability and trust. And so then my fifth and final ninja trick to beating the algorithm is uh, serving your audience. Um, so a lot of what I already said is all about serving your audience and getting to know your audience. Um, but I am all for serving your audience in a way that doesn't feel pushy. Um, a lot of people show up on their Instagram just talking about the cell or what they do and um, not using the four tips that I've already given to actually engage and build relationship with their audience. And so a lot of people use formal language or language that says we, when it's really just one girl, um, working as the business owner, you know, as a side hustler or whatever. And I used to do this the first five years of my business. I thought I had to have this formal, elegant language, um, because I was this wedding stationer working with top notch, you know, wedding clients. And I felt like I needed on all my website copy to say, we here at Monvoir, et cetera. Like it just removes your personality from your brand. And now more than ever, uh, people are wanting to purchase your offers, book you for your services, et cetera, because they trust you and they like you. Um, and maybe they have something in common with you or they resonate with what you believe in, et cetera. So um, pulling your audience toward your content versus pushing it on them is huge. So instead of saying something like click the link in bio to go purchase my new prints or whatever, you could, you know, along the past couple of months of 
building out your prints and creating your prints that you're going to list in your shop or whatever. You're sharing your process of the painting, the scanning, and the Photoshop. And somebody who maybe had no idea that you even had a shop or hasn't bought from you but is aware of your shop, et cetera, is now engaging with your products without having being sold to. And so it's naturally doing the selling for you in a way that is authentic and it shares your behind the scenes and it doesn't overtly come across as salesy as like, I design prints and I have a shop, go purchase here. Um, and so sharing your process is huge because it's really interesting to see those behind the scenes and those tutorial type posts. People love seeing how something is made. Um, and so if you share that, people are gonna engage with that. And um, like I mentioned earlier too, if you are focusing on the relationship and serving your audience so that you're actually trying to get to know them, um, then they are always going to want to engage with your content and they're thirsty for that next post and they are ready to either purchase what you offer or recommend you to somebody who maybe it's not for them, but maybe recommending them, recommending your brand to somebody who it is perfect for. And so I am so obviously passionate about Instagram strategy and helping businesses and brands beat the Instagram algorithm. And that's really just like working with the al algorithm and actually helping brands improve their strategy and see real results on their business. And so I hope that was helpful, those five tips. And then also um, that's why I came out with my online course, Instagram for creatives, because it goes even further. That really only scratches the, sur the surface. Um, but Instagram for creatives is like, basically my brain dump of all things Instagram and beyond. Um, and yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my, well, actually I have one more question. And then my mm -hmm. next question was going to be about your course. Um, okay. This is back to something we mentioned really early on in the conversation, but didn't mm -hmm. get super deep into. And I'm just curious how you feel about the, the new update where they're hiding likes. Yes. So I am all for it. I really, um, I mean, if you think about it, literally people scroll through their feed and double tap without even thinking about it, without even stopping. And so liking is the most mindless way of, an eng of engaging with a person's um, posts that you could possibly give to somebody. And so that's why we just, instead of, you know, complaining and being frustrated about it, we, we just need to shift and pivot with the algorithm and work with it. And so getting people to comment share and save your posts is way more like uh, helpful in terms of beating the algorithm than liking obviously. And that's obviously what Instagram is trying to get people to do more because again, like I was saying, it helps their stock prices if people are spending more time on their app. And so comments take more time than double tapping, uh, saving and sharing, uh, sharing to their friends and typing out a message like, check out this post. I love this post or I love this girl's work or whatever. Um, takes a lot more time than just double tapping and scrolling and it doesn't build a community. So again, if you're really wanting to know what your audience audience needs from you and what their biggest questions are, their biggest needs are and how you can serve them, then getting them to comment um, and DM and all of that and reply to your stories is way huge and liking like I am all for it because my husband used to work with middle schoolers and um, the effects that the numbers and the likes in that game has on kids is just really, really discouraging and terrifying, honestly. That's, that's what I was going to say, actually. And not, I mean, from the perspective of thinking of it with kids is even crazier, but I was thinking just as an artist, like mm -hmm. getting wrapped up in like, mm -hmm. oh, that, that, like, you know, I got more likes on the, on this thing and less on that thing. And you yeah. can still see your own, but there's something mm -hmm. to like, right. not thinking about it anymore. You're going to post what you're going to post because it's what you like to create no matter what. Exactly. Um, the only downside that I've, I've figured out with this is that like from a strategy perspective, I used mm -hmm. to be able to go to other people's posts and see mm -hmm. how many likes and how many comments they're getting on certain like types of posts. And you can mm -hmm. kind of strategize and look at it and be like, Oh, mm -hmm. that did really well. I, like I, the style that they edited that mm -hmm. worked really well. And this one didn't. So well. and like that to me was interesting and you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But knowing that other artists can't do that to me is also really nice. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you can actually still do that through plan. If you have the business plan, mm -hmm. um, you can look and creep. It's so weird. I rarely do it, but I should, because it's smart, like in terms of analyzing your competition and all of that and strategy, but, um, you can look at, uh, like you can search basically anybody on the app and see, um, how they're performing. And like you said, you can still see the likes that you're getting, et cetera. And so a lot of people feel like, um, 
yeah, it, what am I going to do? How is this going to affect my brand? Like people won't be able to see how this is doing. And it's funny too, like the most likes I get on my posts are of my family and like, especially my child, like people love seeing miles and I, mean, I he's get, cute, so. he's so cute. He's so cute. <laughs> and I get like thousands of likes on those posts, but the posts where I'm like talking about my next course or, you know, all of that kind of stuff d- does bad in terms of the amount of likes that I get. And so if I were able to somehow monetize photos of my child on Instagram, which I don't plan on and I definitely don't want to, but I'm saying like that doesn't actually pay my bills. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we have to just shift our focus from the vanity metrics, like I was saying, and remember that, okay, that's nice. Good for you. Cute. Um, you got a thousand likes or you got more likes on that photo or whatever, but how are we actually driving real results with our business from that? Yeah. And typically not from the double taps. Yeah. So I'm all for it. Okay. So, uh, I want you to tell us more about your course, like what's, what's in it, what's included, who's it for. And then Mm -hmm. we're going to do a fast questions round speed round of funny questions. I'm going to pepper at you. Awesome. I can't wait for the questions. Oh my gosh. I'm nervous. I'm just kidding. (laughs) All right. So Instagram for creatives is, um, not just about the algorithm, but in module, it's a five step implementation plan for marketing and sales strategy. So beyond Instagram creatives in general, just suck at sales. And I used to be this way for the first five years of my business. I had no idea how and when to show up for my audience, what to say. I didn't know anything about breadcrumbing and all of that. And so in the first module, I go through a really, really thorough in-depth, um, you know, videos on understanding the algorithm. So basically what I shared here and way more, um, and everything from how to get on the explore page, how to measure and analyze your story metrics, like next taps, exits, impressions, and reach and developing a formula for that to understand what's actually resonating, um, and how to generate new followers and whatnot. So you're actually understanding the algorithm. Then the second module of Instagram for creatives is all on branding and aesthetics. So I go through tutorials in Procreate and Illustrator and Photoshop on how to design your own story highlight icons, how I edit and take photos, how I, you know, edit my um, videos for my Instagram and IGTV and all of that. And then also your bio. Your bio is one of the most forgotten about places for most profiles, but it's also one of the most important places. Um, And a lot of people just like, all this text. And so I go over crafting a clever bio and cutting through the noise there. And then the third module is on telling your story. So using stories for business, but then also storytelling and how to actually craft your captions in a way, like we were saying earlier, to um, tell a story that resonates with your different types of audiences um, or people within your audience um, and how to design branded stories that generate engagement. So Instagram stories and beyond. So actually story, storytelling. And then I'm probably most excited about the fourth and fifth module because it goes beyond Instagram and actually like mindset shifts to make. Um, module four is selling without sleaze. And it's all on the mindset shifts that we need to make to become better at sales. And instead of thinking it in a way that's like slimy and sleazy and, you know, like used car salesman tactics, we need to think about serving and adding value to our audience and Things like the 80-20 rule and breadcrumbing technique, et cetera, are a bunch of things that I get nitty gritty on and launch frameworks and what works and what doesn't in terms of when to show up and how to show up. Um, Because a lot of people, while they have a lot of great things to say and offer, um, they show up at the wrong time or they don't do their offers enough service um, in providing the right information. And then the fifth module is all on crafting funnels. So getting your people off of Instagram and onto something like reading your blog post, purchasing your offers and signing up for your email list. So my email list is significantly less subscribers than the size of my audience on Instagram, but it's also where I generate probably 60 to 70% of my income. And so, um, because there's no algorithm in your email. And so if you're showing up correctly, like think about black Friday was recent, you know, a couple months ago or whatever. And, um, think about when you open your email on black Friday and you're just like, Holy shnikes. I had no idea I was even subscribed to some of these people. 
and there's like hundreds of the same, you know, say first sale of the year, only sale of the year, buy now, you know, buy one, get one free or 20% off. We never do this discount, whatever. Like that is just noise. And so how do we craft funnels in a nurture sequence in our email list that can actually serve, 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 serve your audience and prime them and get them ready to purchase from you because they, they love you. Um, and so there's a template in there for, you know, building out an actual welcome and nurture sequence, 12 emails worth. Um, so you can just adjust the copy and tweak it for your own brand and whatnot. So that is available, the course by itself. And then there's also a private Instagram for creatives, Facebook group for every student to network and to go follow each other and boost engagement on Instagram and to share feedback and ask questions that go beyond the course in business, business related, Instagram related, marketing, whatever, and answer questions there. And yeah, I'm really excited about the course. It's a good one. Um, cool. Yeah, well, I will, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, very in depth. I will um, <laughs> link to that down below and it's available all the time, right? Like it's not yes. an open close. Okay. Yes. Cool. Evergreen. Cool. So I will link to that for people. Um, would you say that your course is better suited for people who have been doing business for a while? Or is it for just anyone who is ever going to try and sell anything art related? Um, so I would say if you have a viable business and you have proof of concept, like viable in the sense of you've at least generated sales that go beyond your mom and your friends, um, in like close, close, close sphere of people, um, then I would say then it's for you. There's, I've done one-on-one -on -one consulting and the one-on-one -on -one consulting that I did with my clients a few years ago is packed in this course. And so like, I've helped people who are calligraphers, photographers, stylists, uh, bloggers, you know, side hustlers, et cetera. And so even if you feel like some of the modules are over your head, like probably module four and five, if you're just starting out, it, you have lifetime access to the course. So you can always come back to those modules. Um, but it will help you open your eyes and see mm -hmm. a mile ahead of you instead of what most creatives do. They can only see 10 feet in front of them. And so they're like, well, this is just what artists do. We list prints and shop and we hope people come and buy. And that just doesn't work um, because especially with all the noise and saturation within um, creative industries and whatnot in the market. So um, even if you're like, wow, this is way over my head, it will at least get you to shift your focus to becoming a future thinker and a more strategic thinker with your creative business. And you can always yeah. come back to it later. Cool. Okay. Uh, it's time for, I don't know what this segment should be called. It's a new segment. I don't have a name for it yet, but <laughs> I love it. It's time for peppering Jenna with questions. Woo. Okay. What compliment do you get most often? Oh, this is a deep one right off the bat. Sorry. Oh man. <laughs> like just from anybody. Yeah. Like, you know, what's a personality trait people comment, compliment you on? I like your eyes. Okay. What's worse, laundry or dishes? Ooh, laundry. Yep. Okay. If you pick up a new pen to test it out, what word or doodle do you draw or write? Uh, my name in cursive. It's so self-centered, <laughs> <laughs> but it's literally something that I've done over and over and over again since I was in like grade school. And so mm -hmm. I just turn my brain off and write my name over and over nice. again in cursive. You have good letters in your name. I hate writing Becca. It's just like, mm. I hate, I hate the double C. It's not, it's Shoot. not nice. Yeah. Double letters aren't fun. Except for N's apparently. Except like for that. N's. <laughs> Very true. Um, mm. who is your art crush? Um, so all time art crush has been Matisse, uh, love, especially his paper mache work, um, and his pastel. What is the last book you read? Um, everything is figure outable by Marie Forleo. Okay. Last one. And this one, um, sometimes gets deep only cause I make it deep if I get into the conversation, but would you rather be able to copy paste in real life or undo in real life? Oh, oh, oh. You're like, whoa, man. <laughs> so existential. <laughs> <laughs> I know, did you see like the three layers of me going over that question? I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> um, I think I would have to say, I guess 
copy and paste. I've made so many mistakes, especially as a business owner, but I'm really grateful for most of them. Um, and so I wouldn't want to particularly undo them because even though they like really, really stung, I feel like it's made me a better business person and a better human. Like the mistakes that I've made in like dating that boy in high school or doing that stupid thing in college or whatever. Like, I feel like I would be very tempted to undo them, but I would, wouldn't want myself to undo them because I feel like they've made me who I am today and the type of business owner and wife and mom and all of that. Um, I like and so, that answer. Yeah. Copy like paste. <laughs> cool. I, I, that one always interests me so much what people's rationale is. Cause usually the, like, it's like an instant, like, Oh, undo, duh, undo. Mm -hmm. But if you think yeah. about it, like, like you said, the layers, you're like, Oh wait, wait, <laughs> yeah, <whoa. laughs> it usually comes back to copy paste at the end. Uh -huh. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. All right, Jenna. Well, thank you so much again for coming back on and talking us through all this. I think that it's going to have to be one that people listen to multiple times and constantly mm -hmm. remind themselves of because it's really hard not to get caught in like the personality competition on Instagram so and everything so yes thank but, you uh, where can people find you and your course I didn't ask that I will put the links below but just say them out loud mm -hmm. first awesome yeah you can find me on Instagram at Jenna Rainey and then my course Instagram for creatives is www.jennarainey.com forward slash Instagram for creatives so you can find the course there Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again so much and I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye, Becca. Bye.